started, please, uh, I, I invite you now to switch off your your camera. But yeah, the purpose, of course, of uh, recording the webinar is, is, is only to be able to share it with the ones who were not able to join today uh, with the participants who registered, but also uh, to share to share this uh, this webinar with with other cities, other operators uh, already working on on clean bus deployment. Uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, of welcoming uh, Anu Kohl. She is product manager of the public transport of public transport at VDL Bus and Coach, and uh, she will be uh, guiding us today uh, through this webinar, uh, technology focus on battery buses. You know, in the frame of the Clean Bus Europe platform, we are going to hold different uh, technology focus webinar. This is the first one, and we are very pleased to have. Anouk uh, today with us uh, to guide us through all the insights of battery buses. One second, I will just mute. Exactly, we are good to go. And uh, yes, uh, let me just give you some uh, words on uh, Anouk's background. Uh, she she has she's uh, engineering mechanical engineering by the University of Twente. And she started at VDL Bus and Coach already in 2015. She has developed a lot of works uh, on the vehicle design, aerodynamics, and thermal management. She's a specialist on the field. And she is a product manager of the new generation of the CTS uh, since already 2020. You might be aware of this uh, of these developments at VDL. Um, the agenda today, you have received this, but this is basically uh, what we will be discussing today. We will have an introduction to battery bus technology. What are the main uh, vehicle components? Uh, also, advantages and drawbacks. It's always good to to have a look to these uh, to these aspects. Then we will go uh, briefly through the uh, what is the state of the of the art of the technology. What are the future developments? And also uh, some insights into the battery technologies and safety which is quite important uh, these days. And at the end, we will go together through some uh, of the charging solution strategies that we have developed uh, for eBus charging. You will see also some uh, insights into the work of the Assure project. Anouk will be uh, guiding you through all this. At the end, we uh, hope, and of course, during, uh, during the presentation, we hope to receive your questions um basically through the uh, through the chat but also please feel free to raise your hand if we if you if you would like to have the word um the, uh, please uh, mute yourself per default uh if uh, if needed i will do that myself uh, but of course i will give you the word whenever you raise your hand and you you would like to make a contribution and for today, basically what we expect is a nice discussion uh, guided by Anouk uh, and uh, a lot of questions from your side. This is what helps us uh, definitely to understand where are the needs, where are the perhaps the, the, the small gaps uh, when it comes to understanding uh, clean bus technologies and uh, the focus today on battery buses. OK, so um, I think uh, without uh, further delay, I would like to pass the floor to Anouk uh, and start the presentation. So I hope now you can see my screen. We do. Good, good, then it works. Well, thanks, Yurida, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so as I said, I'm from VDL Bus and Coach, so I also will use the experience here from the bus development and design to, to in a little bit explain the technologies used in electric city buses. So to Your mic muted, Anouk. Sorry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> now it, it works. It works again. Yeah. So at VDL Bus and Coach, we started introducing the electric city buses in 2013. At that time, we saw the first discussions here in the European Union with different countries and uh, customers in the cities that they want to swap to uh, zero emission public transport. Uh, so at Fidia Bus Coach, we introduced uh, in 2013 the first electric city bus, which is uh, the picture here on the left on the UITP in Geneva event. Um, and like all of the bus suppliers, the same for us, we took our diesel bus and we took the diesel parts out and we replaced it with electric bus components. So diesel driveline out, electric driveline in, uh, fuel tank out, batteries in. That's how we started off in 2013. 
Um, it was quite successful. I think, uh, like most of us, our competitors, we now have over a thousand buses, PDL electric buses in operations all over Europe. You see some examples here, uh, some pictures from uh, uh, the islands of the Netherlands. You see here on the in the left bottom the example the bus of Cologne. Uh, it's a uh, it's many different applications, uh, but of course, after operating more than 1000 buses in Europe, you get some learnings about our bus. When designing and introducing and implementing an electric bus, you see some challenges. Um, I have uh, would like to mention the four main challenges when you go from a diesel bus to an electric bus. The first one, here's an example of our uh, electric bus implemented in uh, in uh, yeah we call it Amsterdam Meerlande that's the region around Schiphol airport here in the Netherlands so that's a quite interesting uh, implementation but what are the main challenges which we are all focusing both suppliers of buses and PTO and PTA um, first one <clears throat> we see a challenge with the components before in a diesel bus we really used often of course the components developed by big truck suppliers for diesel trucks so we use the diesel engine, we use the gearboxes from uh, from ZF, from DAF. Uh, and when we switched to electric, suddenly, uh, specifically also in the beginning, these suppliers were not available. The standard component tree was not available. We had to look for a new suppliers and also a new supply chain, also for repair and maintenance, quite challenging. Um, for example, in our case, this is a bus which is shown here in the, in the, on the PowerPoint. We had to use a Siemens electric driveline and supplier we don't know before for diesel buses. Another important challenge is, of course, the battery. You see here an example in this bus, we're using a 170 kilowatt hour battery system, um, which is fast charging, by the way, but I will come back to it in, in, in this implementation in uh, Amsterdam. But the battery brings many challenges. First of all, because we see many different suppliers with many different technologies. If, yeah, some of you probably are very much interested in battery technology, and every week you can read something different about the new chemistry, a new charging solution, which is also tough for a company like Video and also for all our competitors to keep uh, on pace on all the developments. And um, we also learned there is not one technology suiting all applications. So your bus needs to be flexible. And another important challenge which I would like to mention is software. Before um, I see someone commenting that he cannot see my slides. Is everybody having the problem or not? No, we see we see the slides. OK, then per I don't know the problem. Yes, perhaps uh, okay. uh, just just uh, yeah, log out and log in again. This normally makes the makes the trick. OK, then I will continue. But the, the third challenge we see is software. Before in diesel buses, every component was more or less running on the diesel engine. We had a diesel engine and we mounted all, uh, all components there. So the compressors, the pumps, everything was powered via the diesel drive line. But now with electric bus, suddenly everything is controlled by software. The software controls when to switch on the drive line, the electric motors, but also the air compressor, the heat pumps. And uh, where we before, VDL and I think for all our competitors, we're focusing more on mechanical engineering. Suddenly we had to get much more expertise in electrical engineering, but mainly also in software engineering, which is a challenge for both PTL, PTA and bus supplier. And the fourth challenge brings me to this slide. I think this is what we're all facing in implementing the electric bus fleets in the cities in Europe. There is a uh, quite tough uh, to understand what is your operation. Before, when we delivered our diesel buses to our customers, we really brought the diesel bus to the customer. We gave them the key and we said, hey, good luck with our bus. Now the customer comes to us and he really asks, yeah, but uh, I, where do I get the power to charge my buses? How fast do I charge my buses with this specific timetable? Some people have a timetable. They drive 24 seven, for example. Here again, the example of Amsterdam Meerlanden around Schiphol region. These buses around the airport drive 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there is no night charging possible. Uh, they really come, where do I get my energy cheap? Do I do maybe smart charging that I can see when the grid is low? Uh, we can maybe switch off some chargers. All these questions came to us. So together with the supplier of your bus and your specific operation, you have to see what is the best solution for my customer. 
So we see, for example, for Amsterdam Meerlanden, for this region now around Schiphol, because they drive 24 seven, they had to get fast chargers on the end of the line. So the bus drives from beginning to end station, and at the end station, we do fast charging with 450 kilowatts for only five minutes every approximately hour. This solution would not have worked out, for example, in the fleet we have here in Eindhoven. There they have specific, yeah, plenty of time in the nights. All buses come back around 12 in the evening and they only start operation again at six in the morning. So we should for go for slow charging. Every customer has a specific solution. When we take all these four challenges, we learned that the first bus, which we introduced in the UITP Geneva in 2013, which was a diesel bus where we put electric componentry in, is not working out anymore. Our customers are asking many, many more aspects of our bus. Of course, they are looking into sustainability, how to get the grid access, eh, which is also a big topic here in the Netherlands, but I think everywhere in Europe. Yeah, to charge that many buses, you need really megawatts of power to your depot. How where can we get it? How do we do the fleet management? When do we charge? What do we do with the driver in between? We see many discussions also on safety, uh, active safety systems. So all this together, we learned we have to look in our new bus platform. We call it the new generation Citea. I think you see the same trend with all the competitors. We really see the buses for electric driveline have a whole new design compared to diesel driveline. But when we discussed what is important for the customer in our product, we learned that one of the most important aspects is TCO, total cost of ownership. What do the customer pay per kilometer to drive our bus? Here on the left, a picture of a diesel bus. It is an average, of course, what we learned from customers here in Euro. A diesel bus, what you pay per kilometer, approximately 10% is the cost price of the vehicle. 10% is the repair and maintenance of the vehicle. 30% is the diesel fuel and 50% is the driver for the operation. So we know for diesel buses, the driver is most expensive part of the operation. Not much to optimize uh, there, of course, not at least not in the VDL side, more in, a, in our PTO timetables. When we were optimizing diesel buses, we were always looking in this 30%. That has strong focus. We had to make sure that the bus is efficient as possible. So it consumes less diesel fuel and it is cheaper in operation. When we go out, by the way, to electric buses, it is looking a little bit different. We see that the bus, the initial investment is higher, mainly because of the battery and also, of course, because of some charging infrastructure. We see approximately 15% of the total cost of ownership is the vehicle and the charging infrastructure investment. Repair and maintenance, I put it here to 10%. Actually, we see it is lowering. We repair and maintenance of electric buses. What we learned the past years is that it is cheaper than diesel componentry. Less turning parts always helps. Then also we see that the, the consumption, the electric energy you need to charge our bus to what it is consuming, is only 15% of the TCO. Electrical energy is in general cheaper than the diesel fuel. We see, however, that for the total cost of ownership, the part of the driver got more expensive. And that's strange because, yeah, the driver has the same salary if it's driving a diesel bus or an electric bus. But I think we all know with electric buses in between the bus have to go to the charger and need to be charged. So every time when the driver have to bring the bus to the charging or swap a bus or something similar, that is of course wasted time that is not used to bring passengers around. So during optimization of our bus, we suddenly were looking into optimizing the energy efficiency and the batteries to mainly make sure that you can drive as much kilometers as on one charge and it is charging fast enough to make sure that the investment of the driver is lower. And that's a different way of thinking for us. Something uh, else I wanted to mention was this. Um, I think we all know, uh, but what we learned is that the customers here in Europe, we see of course three kinds of implementations. We see really customers driving city operation, for example, customer like Berlin or Paris or Amsterdam, they really have low uh, speeds, average speeds, approximately 12, 13, 15 kilometers per hour, short one application. Uh, we see customers driving suburban and we see customers driving regional transport. So regional is really, for example, here in the Netherlands, when you drive from Eindhoven to Valkenswaard. So in between the cities, they have a higher speed. But 
we saw one solution is not suiting all. We see tenders, city, partly the buses drive city transport, but the next day they drive suburban transport. So it's really important for our bus to understand how can we have one platform driving three different types of applications and average speeds. It's really important to understand what is your application to make sure you have the right batteries and componentry in there. So these are the eight, we call them vehicle properties to summarize which were key in designing and selecting the bus for your application to customers. We see often in tender applications for PTOs and PTAs, demands for driving range, for the driver ergonomics. Important to mention it, I will not mention it much more in this presentation, but we learned that the sick leave among bus drivers in Europe is really high. In, in average, we see sick leaves of approximately 10% among bus drivers, and often that's coming from pain in neck, shoulders, back, and translated back to ergonomics. So we see also much more focus by from our customers for the ergonomics, mainly from the PTO side. Design and user experience. Um, we see that many city centers are now closing the city centers for cars, and they really want to make sure that the public transport is uh, accessible for everyone, also for elderly people, for students, for businessmen. Everyone should be attracted by the design of the bus. This bus should be more like a waiting area. Safety is very important, both safety of the driver as well as the passengers around the bus, because yeah, we're still driving in city centers. So unfortunately, much more accidents. Climate comfort, mainly also for the attractiveness for passengers. The repair and maintenance, of course, that makes sense. It was 10% of the TCO approximately. The MVH, both for the comfort of driver and passengers and the capacity, of course. We see in general that electric buses, because of the batteries, are a little bit heavier than diesel buses. So heavier buses mean immediately also a little bit lower passenger capacities allowed in the vehicle. But yeah, that's of course is not wanted. So how can we optimize it? Uh, unfortunately, um, I don't have the time to discuss all eight of these aspects, so I decided uh, in, uh, in discussion with Aida, we focus on what is now the parts made of an electric bus. And that mainly translated it back to the TCO and the energy consumption. Um, at VDL, um, probably it was already some of you also this uh, joint uh, presentation of uh, my manager Alex de Jong uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we introduced a new generation Citea, which was developed purely as an electric bus. And I would like to use that bus uh, as an example. What are now the components used in an electric city bus? So electric city buses in general, the most important one, you have a high voltage control box. And the high voltage is, of course, powered by energy from batteries. Um, it depends on what brands you will use, uh, but we see a trend, of course, in electric cars and also coming up in electric buses, also at VDL, to put more of the batteries in the floor to lower your center of gravity for more comfort experience and, and less motion sicknesses and stability. So, for example, for us, we see standardly all batteries are in the floor. Optionally, you can add some batteries on the roof if you really want a high driving range. Then we have some energy consumers. Most important energy consumer is the electric drive line. I will come back to it later in the presentation, but for us, we have electric motors in the axle. And uh, so two motors, one on each side, drive, powered by separate inverters. The second energy consumer important is the heat pump. Of course, we need to heat and cool still the cabin of the passengers and the driver, but also the batteries. So the heat pump is really important. Normally we see it works on 400 volt AC. That's why we have DC AC converter there. Uh, we also have a DC AC, DC AC inverter, 400 volts for the air compressor. Air compressor is like diesel buses still used for the kneeling, for the braking and some smaller auxiliaries like the horn. And then finally, we have some small energy consumers uh, powered on the 24 volt system. So 24 volt battery also in between, that is the power steering, so the steering pump for hydraulic power steering. And you often have, of course, still some cooling on the drive line, so to cool down the motors, the so drive line, so with a water pump and a cooling fan. And you have some smaller auxiliaries like the computers, the lighting, uh, the destination signs, not mentioned here, but it's all powered via 24 volt. And last but not least, of course, the charging of the bus. We see often standardly a plug 
for slow charging and sometimes depends on the kind of operation for fast charging a pantograph uh, we'll come back to it later in the presentation but this is the main componentry in an electric bus and i mentioned already on the tco slide it's really important to understand what is the energy consumption of our bus and how can we improve it to see how can we improve the timetable and the operation of the customer to understand how can we improve the TCO and the driver cost and spend as less time as possible on charging in the specific time. Day. So what is the energy consumption of an electric bus? Um, I used my uh, slide I made for customers for the current CTEA. So this is not for the new generation CTEA, but for the current CTEA. So I think it's a good reference for um, cities, city bus uh, electric city buses in operation today. We see similar operations in, in also our competitors. Standardly, the reference consumption of a 12 meter bus, be aware it's a 12 meter city bus, is approximately 0.6 kilowatt hours per kilometer. That's rather low. This is really for driving outside the rush hour, so only with three, four, five passengers. And um, it's a nice spring or autumn day, approximately 15 degrees, no harsh wind, no extreme wears. But of course, we see higher consumptions in specific scenarios. First of all, the driver has a big impact. You can see you really can add 25% on your drive style. We see really here, for example, in Eindhoven region, that there is a difference of approximately 30% in energy consumption, depending on what driver is behind the wheel. Aggressive acceleration, aggressive deceleration, do a lot of braking actions really has an impact on the energy consumption. Then of course, also, the speed, when you go more to city bus applications, so sort one application, a lot more uh, lower average speed, a lot more uh, uh, bus stops and uh, traffic lights, you have to do a lot of braking and acceleration has an impact. Of course, passenger loads. So if you add, for example, approximately 40 passengers, you add approximately 0.1 kilowatt hours per kilometer. Side wind is really important. I'm from the Netherlands, so we don't have uh, we have a lot of countryside without trees here in the Netherlands, and then side wind has a real big impact. So if in a very windy day, we really see an impact on the energy consumption. Kneeling is often underestimated. If you really kneel down the bus automatically at every bus stop, so every, for example, eight, nine hundred meters with seven centimeters, that really can add 10, 15 percent on energy consumption. Road slopes makes sense. We also know it from diesel buses, but going uphill, say of course is a huge energy consumer and you cannot gain back all the energy you consumed going uphill by driving downhill so really approximately a slope of five percent which is rather high eh? you don't see it here in the netherlands but maybe more in the alps in in switzerland italy uh, france you can add five percent but most important and that's my key message is the climate system um, approximately you add 50 percent of energy consumption in very warm days so approximately 35 degrees on average temperature, and you can even double the energy consumption on cold days, for example, at zero degrees by the heating. This is what we now see as one of the big challenges when you want to improve the energy consumption for the TCO, the heat pump is key. So uh, I, I would like to nice mention that you see a lot of trends in the, in the electric buses, also in electric cars, I think you see similar trends. What is now changed in the bus? So I put two pictures in. Um, I made both my pictures myself. These are uh, very nice tests we did in uh, Lapland. So we have been with both the new bus and the current uh, generation bus to Swedish Lapland for several weeks to drive on extreme conditions. And you can immediately see what we have changed. And I think this is, I think, general for most of the competitors for an improving the electric bus energy consumption for the operation for the for the cities. We see before we always use mirrors, suddenly we have cameras. And in general, when you look to our new bus, same as in cars, we have much more aerodynamic. So it's an aerodynamic design. It's nicely curved in the front. We have some sharp edges and wings in the back, flush side walls, cameras instead of mirrors, all done for mainly intercity traffic. You see, of course, also that the driveline is now introduced in the rear. 
And we see that, yeah, you cannot see it in the picture, you have to believe me here, but the batteries moved. Before we had a rather high bus, new bus is approximately 20 centimeters lower because batteries moved from the roof to the bottom, which is very important for the stability, the driveline performance, and also the comfort of the passengers for sickness, motion sickness. But then I said, we want to improve the energy consumption of our bus and to help the customers for the TCO. Most important, I just mentioned this, is of course, the climatization, the heating of the drive line, of, uh, of the bus. Before in a diesel bus, you had the engine, the diesel engine. The diesel engine normally works on approximately 90, 100 degrees on average, need to be cooled down with glycol and the heating capacity put in that glycol, we can reuse to heat the cabin. That one is unfortunately not available anymore in an electric bus. First of all, because an electric drive line is much more efficient. Eh? Diesel drive line has an efficiency of approximately 30%, electric drive lines of 90 to 95%. So no waste heat there. And in general, we cool the drive line of an electric bus on approximately 40 degrees. You need a glycol of 40, 45 degrees, not the 90 anymore. So more or less no waste heat left. So you need another solution, heat pumps or electric heater to warm your cabin. This is what I already showed on the slide before, uh, but really we see on a very cold or hot day, so zero degrees or 35 degrees as an example, we see 60% of the energy consumption of our bus goes to the climate system. So more than half of the energy consumption is heating the cabin. Then we can do several things. Of course, you can put more batteries in the bus to compensate for this consumption and improve your driving range. You can maybe invest in a fast charging solution which is really expensive, both on battery side as well as on the charger side, or we can really look into how to optimize the bus and your application in your city. So I, the, the, yeah, to more or less what, what I want to say is there are three important things you really have to understand designing your bus and selecting the bus for your operation. You have to understand what battery do I want to use for my operation? What drive line? Because that's still the biggest energy consumption of the consumer on average. And what do I do with my climate system? So I would start with the battery. I think um, when you go look into city buses for both to have VDL, but also the competitors, there are many different chemistries online. Um, you see some of us are using nickel, magnesium, cobalt batteries, so NMC batteries. You see LFP batteries, lithium iron phosphate batteries. You see lithium titanate oxide batteries. You can forget the chemistries, but I think these are the four most used battery chemistries in electric city bus and also electric cars. Most used is LFP for slow charging buses. So often, for example, the, the, the Chinese buses from uh, BYD or Yitong often use LFP because it's a uh, has a good safety, very long lifespan, and it is cheap. It's cheap for big batteries. NMC is the second most used chemistry. That one is a bit more expensive, but it has a very high uh, energy density, which is key, of course, for us. And it has a better uh, charging performance. It can be charged faster and discharged faster than LFP. So really understand what is your application and what battery do we use? And I can say at VDL, we prefer NMC, mainly for the two reasons I just gave you, mainly for the high energy density. So a bit of a comparison on the key figures of the three chemistries most used, which also at VDLs were used. We see LFP and NMC are mostly used. NMC has a bit higher energy density, mainly also the volumetric density, and um, can be charged and discharged a little bit faster. Mainly the 1.5C for charging is important for us. So at VDL, but I think there's not one solution fixing all, but VDL we now at the moment prefer NMC. Mainly, as said, we wanted to put the batteries in the floor for lowering the center of gravity, which is really important for the weight distribution and therefore also the passenger capacity as well as the drive line performance for high stability on the road. And we see that faster charging is a demand for city bus operations, specifically also for city bus operation, which have to drive 18, 20, even up to 24 hours a day. The drawback of NMC compared to the LFP is LFP has a higher temperature set off for thermal runaway, which is really important for safety. Yeah? We see all got a lot of discussions for battery uh, fires 
LFP, you can comment. It has a little bit better performance and safety. Um, and also it has a lower cost for, uh, in general, it's cheaper chemistry to use. So for battery buses, it can, can be an interesting one. Uh, but in general, I think it's really important to understand a battery is different from diesel. The, in general, you need a very big and heavy and expensive battery to get a driving range similar to what you can with some liters of diesel in your fuel tank. We know batteries are really 30, 40% of the cost price of the bus. And also making a big impact on the weight of the bus. Um, so to conclude the battery part, understand your operation. Uh, a large battery can give you, of course, a very big driving range, which is nice for some applications. But understand, do we really need it for my timetable and do the charging in between? Because a large battery also means automatically a lot of weight in the bus and a lower passenger capacity. Also, the other side, a smaller battery gives you, of course, a lower weight and a lower cost price. So a better, big, better, better passenger capacity. But of course, demands often a fast charging solutions to still have a decent driving range, which is quite an expensive investment. In general, be aware also for batteries. There are two important things. A battery, of course, degrades over time. You know it also from your, your mobile phones and your laptops. The older it gets, the better for the poorer the performance of your battery. You need to charge it more often. The capacity is degrading. It cannot be charged as fast anymore. So understand your operation and when to replace the battery. Of course, the uh, bus suppliers like VDL can use support you on this. We know the figures of the batteries, but be aware of it. Then I said the biggest energy consumer of our bus is driveline. And uh, when you look into VDL, but also in the competitor buses, we see three different types of driveline used. Some of us are using a central motor. A central motor has a nice one. It is a low weight in general. It can have often a very good uh, energy efficiency, but it is some challenging because you need some gears in between, differentials in between to still power the wheels, which also gives us more noise. You see now, actually most used is the electrified axle. So this is one is from, from ZF, for example. You see that electric motors are just beside the wheels. So you have two motors means that you have uh, the power almost directly to the wheels. Uh, you have a very nice low floor design uh, because the motor, of course, still needs to be placed under the floor. Here you can really have a low floor design with an island in between. Uh, but bad thing is the weight, and it is an expensive one to invest in and also to repair and maintenance. The most expensive solution is the motor in the wheels itself. It is, uh, of course, the best for the layout and the and the and the capacity is in the bus, but in general, it's a high uh, impact on the capacity and it's a really expensive solution. I think these are general the pros and cons, but the most important comment I want to make here, it doesn't matter which way you take. Electric motors compared to diesel drive lines are all similar efficiency. Maybe the one has an efficiency of 92 and the other one of 93% on average. It hardly makes a difference. You will not notice in your operation. So that also for a video was most important. We decided for using the axle for low floor designs because of the low floor design. And for the low entries, we use the central motor pure. It's for the layout and for the initial investment. On the impact on cost price and on efficiency was only very low. Brings me to the most important part I wanted to mention, the climate system. As said, climate system is the biggest energy consumer in an electric city bus on extreme days. So on, on average, the driveline is the biggest consumer, but on extreme days, the climate system is even a bigger energy consumer than a driveline. So it's really important for the customers to understand what is the impact of the climate system on what temperatures do I drive it? Uh, so both the ambient temperatures and the interior set points. So you really need to understand what is then the climate system of an electric bus. Small introduction, this is a diesel bus. In diesel bus, I think we all know how the heating and cooling works. You have a diesel drive line in the back, in the rear, and the diesel drive line, of course, produces a lot of waste heat, which via glycol can be brought to the cabin to warm up the cabin via convectors on the floor, via front box at the driver, or even via the rooftop unit. 
and blow it into the ducts in the ceiling. And for the airco, air conditioning, for cooling the cabin, we of course mount an air, com air co compressor to the diesel engine and via the refrigerant and the rooftop box, we can cool down the air from the roof of the bus. Then you go to electric bus, and this is an example of our current uh, CTA bus, which is, I think, a similar system for all the competitors. Of course, in an electric bus, you don't have the diesel drive line anymore. So what's most often done is two things. You first take the AC unit on the roof. So the compressor is not mounted anymore at the diesel drive line, but the compressor and the revision cycles mounted directly into the heat pump on the roof, and you make it reversible. So of course, normally in AC, you get fire the refrigerant, the heat in the cabin out. But when you reverse the loop, you can also take the heat from the ambient in, heating the cabin. Drawback of that, of course, is the system is mounted on the roof. Perfect for ACF, from air conditioning, you want cold air coming from the roof. But for heating in general, heat is rising, so you want heating to be done mainly from floor level. Not be done with the heat pump, at least not for most current electric buses. Therefore, we still have to replace the diesel engine with either an electric heater, so a water boiler you know from your home, or either a diesel fuel heater, the Babasta, which is heating still some glycol, and that glycol is then heating the bus via the convectors on the floor or the front box. The drawback is this heat pump, because it has a refrigerant cycle, is rather efficient. It has a COP, a coefficient of performance of approximately two to three, so one kilowatt of electric energy in, you get two or three kilowatts of heating or power uh, cooling power out. The electric heater is electric, so zero emission, but has a very poor performance, a COP of one. One kilowatt in, one kilowatt out. Brings me to the new generation CTEA, and I think this is a trend you also see in electric cars, and it's really important to understand. Why do we need the heat pump directly blowing air in the ducts? That's, that's something you know from ACs, from diesel buses, but it's not necessary anymore for electric buses. We have to understand it. So what we have done at VDL is we designed a heat pump with a very small refrigerant cycle. We don't make it reversible anymore because every fault you put in between is energy losses. So heat pump is there. Heat pump has a refrigerant cycle and on one side the condenser and on one side the evaporator. We both connected them to glycol. So on one side you take heat from the glycol and you produce cold glycol, and on the other side you put the energy in the glycol and you produce warm glycol. So you have continuously heating and cooling power available, and you bring it to where you need it. You can bring it heating the hot glycol to, for example, the convectors to heat from floor level, to the driver's cabin, to warm up the driver's cabin. You can bring it to the roof. And the nice thing of this is that you have a very efficient heat pump, which can use also for heating from floor level or cooling from the driver. And you can do it simultaneously. So, for example, what you can do is you can heat the passenger cabin, for example, on a day that it is only 15, 16 degrees and it is not much uh, of, of sun. It can be rather cold in the passenger cabin because you open your doors often, but the driver still have some sun on the windshield. And it has a closed compartment. That one maybe wants some cooling. That can be done. You can do heating and cooling on the same time. So I think this is a trend you will see much more often in electric buses. Uh, three, of course, the heat pump needs to be efficient to save some energy on heating and cooling. But two things which you should keep in mind, of course, also the insulation of an electric bus is really important. You know it from your home. I'm not sure if some of you have some uh, discussions of do I need double glazing? Do I need single glazing? Should I invest in extra insulation in the floor? In general, for electric buses here in Western Europe or Northern Nordics, yes. We standardize, for example, on double glazing. It's worth it. You really can earn back the investment also on the extra weight and saving some energy and heating. If we go for Southern Europe, so Spain and Italy, maybe a little bit different discussion because you focus more on cooling, but the rest of Europe, yes. And also be aware of the impact from your own application, the temperature set points. You know, the discussions from your home probably in the winter as well. Se putting your heating two or three degrees lower saves a lot of energy. Also, that gets more important than electric buses. Understand what is really comfortable for your passengers. And I'm convinced that in general in city buses where passengers are only there for 10 to 15 minutes on average and still have their coats on in the winter or have shorts in the summer, you don't need the similar set point as in your office. 
for your home. Uh, so someone's putting a question, where's the Robusto here? So me, sir, personally, uh, you don't need it. In general, we see heat pumps can be operated from minus 15 to plus 50. If you are, however, a Nordic country, most heat pumps from, from VDL, but also from competitors, are really below minus 15, so minus 20, minus 25. Uh, heat pump, the refrigerant is too viscous, so you need electric heaters. So that's why I put optional high voltage heaters. And some of the fleet owners still want to use a diesel fuel heater on these extreme days to save some energy. That's a discussion you should have on your application. But for Western Europe and Southern Europe, you for sure will not need it anymore. Um, last but not least, uh, I want to comment on uh, infrastructure charging. I said for TCO, eh, you want to make sure you have an efficient heating system, efficient drive line, an optimal battery solution for the best driving range and timetable operation to spend as less time on charging and save on driver cost. But of course, you need to understand also how to charge my bus then. Uh, I made an overview of all kinds of charging solutions here used in electric buses. Of course, we see both charging, conductive charging as well as inductive charging. You see still some, for example, when you go to China, still some often use battery swapping. So instead really charge the battery in the bus, you just take the whole battery out and replace it with a fully charged battery or even bus swapping. That's what we example saw when we started the first operations in 2014 and 2015. You take the bus out of operation temporarily to charge it and get the fully charged bus back in, but it is rather expensive. So often we see charging from the battery in the bus itself. Can be done statically, so during the bus is parked, can be done dynamically with in-motion charging. In-motion charging, however, demands a very high uh, investment in the infrastructure, you know, for trolley buses. So if you have the infrastructure, that's very nice. You have already made the investment, but in general, we see with our customers that it is too expensive to invest in it. So we see most customers use the manual connection or the automated connection. Manual means you really have to plug in into your bus or into your car. We see AC and DC charging and or automatically we see either uh, often pantographs moving up or down. So multigraph moved on the roof of the bus going up into the charging hatch or an inverted pantograph so that you have roof bars on the bus. So from an infrastructure side, pantograph coming down on the bus. You even see some robot arms now in, in, uh, in development and underfloor charging. I think it's really important to understand what is the charging power I have available from the grid and what is my application in my timetable. We see most used in electric buses are the plug, always DC charging, so the CCS type 2 plug. And we see often pantographs used for fast charging. So plug for slower charging, pantographs for faster charging. Both roof mounted as well as inverted pantograph are often used. And for trolley buses, as said, emotion charging is relevant. Most used for electric buses are these three, a uh, four, sorry. Um, first, uh, the plug. I think the plug, as in cars, for slow charging is the cheapest solutions by far. So for charging a bus, for example, an application, I, I can give an example here for um, the line, which is a big customer for us here in, 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 Flan in Flanders in Belgium. Uh, they often, most of their buses come back into the depot between 12 in the evening and 6 in the morning. They have plenty of time to charge the battery and then the way cheaper solution is to plug it normally. And uh, you have two types of plugs. The, we have plug charging up to 200 amps. That is the standard plug you also know from cars. So you can do uh, approximately 150 kilowatt charging with that plug maximum. You can even get a plug which can charge faster up to 500 amps, but you need an actively liquid cooled plug, which is a little bit expensive, more expensive on both bus side as in infrastructure side. So really understand what is my time and my grid power available for deciding on what plug to use. And then you have the two pantographs. Um, we see Inverted pantograph, so charging on uh, the infrastructure part side, and the pantograph comes down onto roof bars. Um, this has the initial investment normally is lower, so you only need one pantograph for multiple buses. Only, uh, of course, you have to also the risk in repair and maintenance. When there is damage on this one pantograph, your whole fleet is down, not only one bus. So that's why we still see most customers demand 
a pantograph mounted on the bus side, so going up to the charging infrastructure. So in case there is something broken, you only have to take one bus out. That's normally acceptable, but it depends on your application. And we see now more and more also in, in France, I think it's in development also led by Alstom, uh, that one is a pantograph more coming from the roof. So it is less ugly in your infrastructure. Uh, be aware that the infra mounted pantograph as well as the underfloor mounted pantograph demands Wi Fi communication. In general, as I said, there is not one solution fixing all. We see that. VDL, but also our competitors, we support several solutions, plug charging, both the cool plug and the not cool plug with different powers. We see pantograph, inverted pantograph, even the underfloor pantograph. Really understand from your city, what is my timetable? How much time do I have in between to charge my batteries? Uh, where connections do I have available from the grid? Can I really have a high power uh, access for, for example, a 450 kilowatt charger, or can I only get access for 150 kilowatt chargers? Uh, what is my grid uh, balance available? Uh, in general, also understand uh, there are some norms. You see also yeah, the new CN norm is in the development, but are there already some nice norms you should really look into? For example, for plug, um, I'm not sure. We had before, when I go two or three years back, asked different solutions. So the one wanted to plug on the right side wall, the other one wanted to plug on the left side wall, the other one wanted in the front wall, the other one in the rear wall, because they all parked buses in a different way. And uh, the VDV said, no, that is really confusing with one time you get a VDL bus and that one has the plug in the front and then you get a uh, Mercedes bus and that one has a plug on the right and then you get another brand that had the plug in the rear. We don't want it. We standardize everyone should have the plug on the right side wall above the front axle because that's where the driver leaves the bus and immediately can plug in in the charging infrastructure and don't walk around the bus anymore. So that is standardized by the VDV. Also, the, stand, the standardized the pantograph position. All buses now have the pantograph above the front axle, so it's easy to maneuver your bus in the right position to get the pantograph into the hatch. Uh, really look into that. That's really quite nice uh, developments. And also, you see a lot of developments coming from the Azure project. I think Aida can tell much more about it than me, but I really standardized uh, the protocols, the connectors, the positioning. I should really recommend look into the reporting. All this means that you have to select what charging you want to use, pantograph or plug, but whatever bus you buy, whatever brand you buy, we should have a similar solution which can be used in your infrastructure. So the last slide to conclude, there is not one bus or one charging infrastructure or one solution meeting all the demands from all the different cities in Europe. To understand what bus to use and also suppliers like VDL can help you with it. Understand what is the daily mileage my bus will drive. Will it drive only 150 kilometers or really do I need intercity operation and drive 600 kilometers a day? What is my time in between for charging? Have I the bus back in the depot in the night and the rest of the day I have continuously driving or do I have peaks in the rush hours and have I some time in between the rush hours to charge my buses? Understand your timetable. Uh, how vulnerable is everything for delays? So um, I'm, it really depends on countries I see, but for example, in the Netherlands, the schedules are really, really tight. We only have, I think, four minutes on average that the bus is standing still on the on the main stations uh, for driver swaps and passengers step coming in and out. So there is hardly, when you have a small delay in charging, immediately the timetable is hit. Some cities have much more time in uh, to, to, to fix up these delays. What is the grid capacity? So both the grid capacity, so for example, um, we see the grid is really big of a hard, hard use in the Netherlands during the day. So in the night, there is some grid power available for charging the buses, but during the day, we are very much limited in the capacities and the powers we can get from the grid. And also the grid connections. It's in the Netherlands, for example, almost impossible to get a grid connection for more than 10 megawatts right now. So you can have a big fleet with fast charging buses, but you cannot get a grid connection. So I really understand what is my grid capacity and connection I can have. And uh, also what can I have in the depot? So normally central stations close to railway things can have higher uh, powers of charging than a depot outside the city centers. 
understand these five things are really important and then you can really look into the suppliers to understand what is the battery chemistry and size I want to use, what kind of charging infrastructure do I want to use and what is the energy consumption of my bus for the TCO making the timetable. So this was my presentation. I hope it gives some nice insights in electric buses. It has been a Fantastic presentation, super complete, Anouk. Thank you very much. Um, I hope uh, our participants have some questions to share now uh, with us. Just please uh, don't be shy and, and raise your hand or uh, just let us know if you have any comment also. We we are also keen on, on discussing uh, whatever topic uh, you, you might have in mind related to, to the technology. Christophe, please go ahead. Your microphone is still muted, I think, uh, Christoph. It's quite unstable. Yeah, yeah. now we can, can hear you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so good to see you again. Uh, thank you for all these uh, these figures. I think it was very um, comprehensive uh, and with many interesting information. I hope we will get soon the, the presentation like that. I think it, it will be quite straightforward. Uh, just one question from from my side. Um, what would be the typical uh, maximum uh, battery capacity of a of a 12 or an 18 meter bus from VDL perspective? So from it, VDL, I yes. can of course. Uh, I think, uh, to be honest, I see in most standards that it is similar for the bigger competitors. Mm -hmm. But on a 12 meter bus, we see normally maximum battery capacities up to, in our case, 490 500 kilowatts. And um, for articulated buses, this goes up to 650, 700 kilowatts. Right. Okay. So that translated normally when you want a fully electric bus, that means that with the biggest battery capacity, normally you can drive worst case, so it is minus 15 rush hour, some mm -hmm. slopes in between, you can drive still zero emission 250 to 300 kilometers. That's the, the, the reference for us. We always want to make sure that's that can be done. 200. 50 to 300 at least worst case at minus 15. Okay, fine. So thank, thank you. Thank you again. No worries. Thank you, Christophe. Any other comment? Yes, Francesco, please go ahead. Hi, question about uh, the type of battery and uh, you speak about uh, battery on the floor. And uh, the question is, is uh, if um, we have to connect, uh, uh, we have to study better the the routes when we, if we decide to, to use a bus with a battery on the floor. Because I think that uh, we can have uh, more damages uh, and so on, not only on the bus, but also, but also on the batteries. Yeah, that's fully correct. And in general, indeed, we see that the main risk, of course, of batteries is thermal runaway. Uh, that can, of course, be initiated by a crash that the battery cells are deformed. So in general, you're you're right eh? when you put the batteries in the in the floor, there is a little bit higher risk of deformation. Um, I think it's also important from the vehicle side to understand that the batteries are really covered in a very strong position. So for us, for example, we have uh, made the rollover standard. We have very strong uh, sidewalls and housing in between. Also, the housing should be uh, watertight. Yeah, because also when there is an, an, an tunnel or something which is flooded by water, that batteries are not filled up of water. Um, but in general, indeed, we have to understand together what kind of operation and bumpy roads you have. Uh, standard, we, we have, for example, a ground clearance of, in our case, 18 centimeters. But for some cities, we maybe can suggest together that we raise it a little bit higher uh, to understand what is used. I think, in general, people are very scared, but you see it also in electric cars. I think the housing and, and, and everything is done is very strong. Most important thermal runaway cannot be reversed. When it starts, it starts. You cannot uh, get it done anymore. So I think it's most important to understand what what needs to be done when there is a thermal runaway. In our case, therefore, we standardized gas detection sensors, for example, that when the hydrogen is produced, you know that thermal runaway is initiated. You still have some minutes to evacuate your passengers. I think that's most important to understand. Um, Thermal runaway cannot be reversed, so you should do everything to make sure it will not happen. But when it happens, you have to 
evacuate bus. Because I have customers asking me, how do I extinguish battery fires? You don't. Batteries are that much energy, you don't extinguish the fire. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Francesco. I think also Mate would like to pose a question. Please go ahead. So, um, hello, my name is Mate. I'm coming from Maribor, University of Maribor. And uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. This was very interesting. Uh, uh, here in Maribor, in Slovenia, uh, we had uh, Interreg project efficiency, and with the municipality of Maribor, we installed a fast charging station at the end and the and the start bus station with the roof mounted uh, pantograph. And as an e bus, we use an Iveco bus with the battery capacity of um, 74 uh, kilowatts. Uh, it's a uh, LTO um, battery. Uh, so we installed two uh, fast charging stations. One is uh, with the power of 150 kilowatts, and the other is with the power 300 kilowatts. So Everything is OK, but uh, lately we have some problems with the charging uh, fast charging station with 300 uh, with the power of 300 kilowatts because sometimes there uh, there is an error and it uh, it's like an error, like a voltage drop. So at the moment we don't know why this error occurs. Um, and maybe if you had some similar, if you know some similar problems, in other cities, so we suppose it's OK. This uh, these errors occurs when there is a, a high temperature outside, like uh, 35 or 36 uh, Celsius. But for now, we are now measuring the substation and also the charging station, also the A bus to find this error. But for now, we don't know uh, why this error occurs. And maybe if you have some information yeah, of course, I don't know the specific uh, application, huh? but what I in general can comment also VDL, the example I showed, I think in one of my first slides, the Amsterdam Meerland, the buses around Schiphol region also use a um, big LTO of a small LTO battery that was in this case 170 kilowatts, but similar chemistry. And also there we did high power charging 450 kilowatts we set up. Uh, so I think it's similar there. And what we learned in general, I, I'm not sure if that's the same problem you had, but Batteries need to be balanced to have a good performance. So both uh, the voltages, so each cell, each battery cell module need to have a similar uh, voltage, as well also the temperature. You want a similar temperature in all batteries. So when one battery pack is a bit cooler than the other one, we had the challenge also. Have some of them were installed in the cabin, some more in the outside on the roof, so they had much colder temperatures. When there is a disbalance, the battery management system will, of course, limit charging powers, even block charging sometimes. So for the LTO chemistry and fast charging, it's, it's really important to make sure you have some time in between to balance the battery cells. So, for example, the Schiphol buses, they drive 24-7, they do fast charging, but once every, I think out of my mind, two or three days, each bus have to come back to the depot briefly in the timetable to do slow charging and make sure the battery cells are actively balanced. And with these fast charging cells, that's even much more important than the slow charging cells. I'm not sure if that's your problem, huh? but that is the learning we did. And that's actually also the reason we see that the investment in, in, in LTO and fast charging is too big now. We That's why we see mostly now LFP and NMC is used in, in bus industry and, and not that high charging rates anymore. But yeah, of course, needs depends on your application. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matej. I think um, we could give one last question if we have another one. We are three minutes over 12, but I think we can afford two minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, extension time. Uh, just please raise your hand. And while you do, I will use. These two seconds just to share with you. At the, just the end of the uh, of the seminar. No questions anymore. OK, so then it looks like everything has been covered. Thank you again, uh, Anouk and uh, and everyone for for the nice uh, for the nice hour for. I think it's very important that we are able to share as much as possible uh, when it comes to the technology, of course. Uh, and the uh, specific operational challenges everyone is, is, is facing. 
uh, most of, of our uh, participants today, they are operators uh, really no? facing these challenges on a daily basis. And we see also we have uh, many uh, bus committee members, UATP bus committee members among the participants, which is always uh, fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, way of discussing. Um, yes, this presentation will be available. We will upload it on the website. Uh, very soon. Also, the recording is available very soon, as you can see on the on the website section. And for today, I would just like to uh, thank uh, Anouk again uh, for for the uh, for the hour presentation, for the very nice uh, and insightful uh, presentation, and invite you to uh, the next to keep an eye on the next uh, on the next webinar upcoming in September. The date will be shared uh, in due time. More information also for registration. You will be receiving the invitation. We will be discussing on uh, natural gas, no? the next technology focus. But for today, I think we are very pleased that Anik, Anouk was with us and she was uh, she was answering also our questions. So thank you very much again and big applause for you. We hope to continue the discussion also off offline whenever needed. Just reach out. You know where to find us. We are very happy to to continue the discussion. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.